Hello. Welcome to Law Master's Lair. I am your Law Master, here to present you the very crux of Orc Month, the Orcs themselves. Today, we'll be going through their history, their culture, and let's not forget the various differences of their betrayal over the decade plus of Pathfinder we currently have. So let's inspect the Horde, shall we? But before we begin, I believe we should talk about what we are looking at, and why I believe doing this Ancestry video is so exciting. As I've said in the past, I try to give Ancestries and classes a wide berth because everyone does them already, while the lore is often not as talked about. Elves were a small exception because I found interesting things I wanted to say. Dwarfs I did because I could not do a toe egg without mentioning dwarves. <laughs> Belkson, I could have done without going too deep into orc culture, or have just done orcs at a later point. However, the interesting thing about orcs is how the betrayal has changed. We have three distinct phases based on the resources we have. The book Orcs of Galarian was actually one of the first player companion books we were given published in 2010, which I believe was before Orcs were even playable. The Whole of Belkson book came out in 2015 and had some noticeable differences. And now, we have the new two ebooks, the Ancestry Guide and the Modern Expanse books, showing Orcs completely different from their 1E selves. Or are they? That is a challenge for me today. I'm looking through three different sources, though mostly focused on the original Orcs of Galarian era information, and looking at it through the lens of Belkson showing the Orcs, while still savage by some humanoid standards, are not just one-note beasts. And the 2E attempts to show that no ancestry is completely on one side of the alignment scale. So let's start stitching everything together. Where do we start? Well, I only skimmed through the ha history last week, so let's take this from the top. The origin of orcs according to those who call Belkson home. Orcs once lived deep underground in the Darklands, struggling to survive like any other creature. That was until the dwarves began ascending, working to find a surface in their legendary crest for sky. Dwarks just, dwarks, orcs just wanted to live their lives in their homes, but dwarfs had their destinies in mind and did not care about a little thing like genocide. Orcs tried their best to fight back, adapting weapons and tools from their foes, but slowly they were pushed back until they found themselves on the surface, a land scorched by the unforgiving sun, which the orcs' eyes were not designed to handle. Or it would have been, if it was not the Age of Darkness, when the world was forever shrouded in night. This allowed the orcs to spread far and wide, a golden age referred to as the Sacking. That was until their old enemies, the dwarfs, finally reached the surface, and started building their sky citadels. Orcs were able to pull off some early victories, reducing the original 10 Sky Citadels down to 7. But the dwarfs slowly pushed them back. The final nail in the coffin was the return of the sun. The orcs had no choice but to retreat to places the sun would not find them, and the Golden Age had ended. But this was not the end for orcs. Many adapted to the surface, to where the light of day was Still painful, but where they were able to continue to function despite the pain. And time and again, orcs did strike out an attempt to conquer again. However, it was not until the rise of the warlord Belkson, the capture of the Sky Citadel Kuldakar, and the establishment of the Hole of Belkson, that the orcs of Avastan managed to reach another golden age, the Reckoning. However, it did not last long. After Belkson's death, the region was divided into seven, before collapsing into squabbles between tribes. 
surrounding nations managed to expand their borders to more or less to hold its current size. That is, we claim some land, see the conquer lands from last week. But that was the end of the story for the orcs for about eight centuries. Since then, twice have the orcs of Berkson united together into one horde. First, during the Shining Crusade, when they served under the Whispering Tyrant, and then again, 200 years later, when the, under the legendary blue dragon, Kazabon. Each time, however, each time the tyrant fell, the orcs have gone back to being separate tribes. That said, there's one more recent event that needs mentioning. The return of the Whispering Tyrant, where he called his orc armies to help him attack Absalom. And they said no. This was not the only reason that the Whispering Tyrant's attack was a failure, but it is one that not only affected that battle, but potentially the coming future. Now, going through orcs, first we need to start with the basics. Orcs are slightly taller than many ancestries, no green or grayish skin known for being muscular. They're flat nose and tusks, which give birth to the common analogy of them being pig-like. They have wolf-like ears, tending to be bitten up in childhood play. And their eyes are red, forever squinting due to the adver how adverse they are to the sunlight. However, one thing they are known for is body art. This is not something... This is something I would have preferred to have in the, the interesting section over the basic one, but it, it's better to get that, this out of the way now, especially since I am putting the thesis of this video at close to the top today. Orcs are known for scars, tattoos, and piercings. While they do not necessarily match any other ancestry sensibilities, orcs are masters with body art. They take scars on in battle. Mix in tattoos made of ink that can be seen in dark vision, and facial tattoos, as well as having most of the wealth that they have as jewelry in their bodies because harder to steal that way. And the end result is fantastic in a metal sort of way. Abastanians are not the biggest fans, but I can say I am. Now with the physical out of the way, before we go through the basics, I need to go through the most basic, but also one of the most interesting parts of orc culture. Not going to flow how I normally like this video too, but in this case, this is important to do right away. So, what is the one thing everyone should remember about orcs? Respect. To be respected is the key linchpin that helps one understand our culture, as well as connect the three contradictory sources of information. L let me lay this out in a way that makes sense. Looking at the classical orcs of the Hall of Belkson and the orcs in the modern expanse. In the Hall of Belkson, the orcs have only known war with the dwarfs, war of the humans, and everyone's seen them as monsters. Therefore, they became a society completely devoted to that war, willing to be a monster to any opponent they meet. In the modern expanse, they found war with the demons, devoted themselves to becoming demon slayers, and gained the respect of other people to where they are less ferocious around their neighbors. Orcs and Berkson bend their heads to those stronger than them, than them, always looking to take the place when the time is right. They also believe in forcing the weak to work for them, including taking slaves. In the modern expanse, the orcs still see a difference between the strong and the weak, but they instead believe the strong should protect the weak. In Belkson, orcs do not create anything thing except the occasional weapon, and steal all the supplies they need. 
In the modern expanse, orcs do not create anything with the occasional weapon. But they have people under their protection willing to farm for them in exchange for the protection they provide. The same basic building blocks of orcish culture turned in two different ways, showing that orcs are creatures who grow 100% on nurture, which to grow into the kind of people they become. So with that in mind, let's look at what orcs are. First, orcs are known for their strength. They can wear heavy armor just fine, wield giant weapons, and separate a head from a body in a single stroke. Needless to say, they are one of the nationally strongest ancestries, something many groups of orcs use as a basis of what respect is. Add on to that their ferocity, they, their readiness to let their passions boil forth. This is something every orc has, even ones raised away from other orcs, which is why barbarians are a common occupation for them. Which is why even the orcs on the side of good are known for bloody combat. Because regardless of how they are raised, it just feels natural. And a quick one through of their senses. Eyesight is great when it's dark, but as mentioned, sucks when in sunlight. The senses of touch, smell, and taste seem to be similar to that of humans, but those hoity toity civilized types look at what orcs eat, smell, and deal with pain wise, and do not believe this to be true. Same with their hearing, but it is very important to note. The orcs' ears twitch when they do stuff. <laughs> it's kind of cute if you're not currently trying to fight one. Diet-wise, orcs are technically omnivorous, but they mainly eat meat. Either raw and bloody, or cooked till it's falling off the bone. They eat anything from pork and beef to rat and bear. And let's not forget, other humanoids. Orcs practice cannibalism, even the ones down in Morgan Expanse, which can be an issue because demon flesh is kind of addicting. In some places, orcs cook double cook orcs cooks double as torturers, and chaotic evil orcs talk about other races as if they were, were as if as they would livestock. Outside of that, however. Orcs eat mushrooms and drink alcohol, with everything else only for when times are really tough or when they wish to season their food. On a less cannibalistic topic, breeding. Orcs are famous for their relatively short pregnancies and ability to mate with other species. Yet for some reason we still only have a playable human half orcs. <laughs> One day. Anyway, orcs give birth to little litters in two to five at a time, where a single birth is a sign of be respected, as orcs believe this means the baby consumed its siblings in the womb, and now has all the strength combined. But speaking of orcs breeding, that brings us to today's first side tangent, the part of the show where both sides are examined thoroughly. Today we start with a big one. After all, half orcs are one of the classic seven races. For one, I would never need to do a video about since they are, as 2E puts them, a heritage. And I also do not need to mention them because it is not like I did so for half elves. But allow me to just briefly touch on half orcs. Half orcs are the best of both worlds to have to deal with the worst of both worlds. Orcs tend to look down on half-orcs for being smaller and weaker. Even in places where this is not true like the modern expanse, half-orcs are treated special, even if it's against their will, and given unwanted attention and protection. Among humans, it depends on those regions' views of orcs. The modern and places like the land of the Norm kings at least treat them with respect. Well, their cousins across most of Alvastan are treated as if they 
monsters, the monsters ready to snap at any time. The fact that they can easily accidentally kill fellow children, or that they still inherit orcish ferocity, does not really help matters. That said, it is possible for the smallest of half orcs to easily take leadership positions in tribes, as long as they can fight well enough to back it up. And the extra bond helps for those half orcs who choose combat careers. And let's not forget, the ability in which half orcs turn their ferocity into nonviolent skills like the bait and poetry, which does allow them to rise without using their fists. Next up, let's go through the ethnicities. Similar to elves, orcs' ancestries are based off of the ecosystems where they live. There are also some cultural differences because of the surrounding cultures, but again, orcs are based off of respect. Places where they find respect, they flourish alongside the neighbor. Places where they are disrespected, they flourish alone. So starting out with the classic orcs, the Narmoth Kaur are the orcs of the plains, the most common ethnicity on Avastan, and those who call the whole of Berkson home. Those are the orc tradition traditionally portrayed as always chaotic evil, but they are also the ones most likely to rely on others, both the members of their tribe and now outsiders with the city of Ogier trying to make diplomatic relationships with other nations. Past disrespects be damned. The other ethnicity which leans chaotic evil are the Enshrok, those orcs return to the underground after being pushed from the surface. They consider the drew up and quest for sky a genocide, Rightly so. But they have decided the best way to get revenge for it is to complete the quest for the cage, freeing Novagug by digging deeper into the earth. Yeah. Next, the orcs, which still see representation in Belkson, we start with the Kolor, or desert orcs, a large number of who call the Dirt Sea of Belkson home. They are almost entirely nocturnal due to little chance of overcast, and young orcs prove themselves to the tribe by keeping watch during the accursed day. Fourth on the list, we have the Karl Marja, or Mountain Orcs. They live in the Kudor and Mindspin Mountains around Belkson, but they can also be found as far south as the Meander Mountains in Cheliacs. They are skilled at jumping, climbing, and taming drakes in order to best navigate their home. Which, taking a short break, brings us to our second side tangent. Another tangent on dragons. They're not true dragons. Instead, today, drakes. Like Lenorms, drakes are a major kind of lesser dragon, with various different species from across the world. Unlike Lenorms, which grew separately from true dragons, Drakes are thought to be genetic offshoots, though much less powerful than their true brethren. They do maintain the flight, the breath, and the ability to speak. However, they are lacking many of the things that make dragons dragons. First off, drakes only have two legs, the others being connected to their wings. Second, they are less intelligent. Yes, this includes less intelligent than white dragons, which is saying something. This leads them to at be even quicker to anger. And yes, still more than white dragons. Drakes adapt to various environments, including the winged words around the world wound and their with riddle part. One more notable place they gather around is in the Hall of Belkson in the sunken city known as the Sleeper. Now let's go through the kinds of drakes that we know. Like the norms, this is just going to be a rapid fire. So we have desert, flame, forest, frost, and river, each from chromatic ancestry. We have ice and jungle too, but different for some reason. Lava and child drakes descend from primal ancestries. 
Sea are considered a mix of various dragons. Rift and Spire are powerful, with no note on their ancestral origins. Either are the strong Ether are the strongest and tamest. So coming from the ethereal plane when they have business in the material. Now for big the done. Two more ethnicities to go. Next are the new or uh, winter orcs. They are first the first ones that are outside the hold. They instead find themselves mostly in the land of the Norm Kings or other Arctic regions. They believe fighting wastes too much precious energy, and mostly on respect by hunting, and they hibernate in the months where the sun rarely sets. And finally, Matanji, or Jungle Orcs. They came to the surface with the rest of their Orc brethren, but decided to sail to the Moana expanse instead of raiding and pillaging for the killings. They made their homes and were happy, until they first fought against demons and found the Chuaka transformed those they captured into more Chuaka. This disrespect did not stand, and the Matanji have spent generations transforming themselves into one of the most respected groups of demon slayers in the Expanse. All six ethnicities, subtly different by ideas of respect and disrespect. Once you learn the central key of how a group works, their actions make more sense. Next up, the places where orcs call home. This section is shorter because we already did the main place of residence last week. Outside of Belkson, we have the settlements in the Darklands, where we know of three major ones. The Edge, which is a fortress on the edge of a large chasm. Warshaft, a tunnel filled with keeps, and Dwarf's End, a base formerly built by Dwarfs where, when they were trying to complete their quest for Sky. As for our Mataji friends, they live in the Nine Walls, a large fortress between the southern lands and the city of Ushara. The land gets its name from the hexagon-shaped walls, each built to ensure demons cannot break through. It takes an entire seven hours from one, for one to travel from the outermost wall to the innermost. It is also home to a large amount of Yamashan people, who work to produce most of the region's crops so orcs can focus on the, the defense. Now, it's time to go through the various things I find interesting about orcs. I already went through some already, but this is the place where I actually make room for such things. First, we have already taken, talked a bit about orcs' physical abilities. But what about the mental? Orcs actually have an amazing mental fortitude, able to expo be exposed to things that would break other species, or at least give them lifelong nightmares, and not bat an eye. Many believe this is connected to another interesting thing about orcs' mentality which is the uh, fact that they seem to be able to repress memories at will. They suffer an embarrassing defeat in battle. They are faced with something terrifying enough to break one's mind. They are rejected by the crush of prom. Close enough. Gone. <laughs> Next is a little less surprising, but something to keep in mind that Killing is not the only way orcs show dominance. They are also known to face their fellows in various feats of strength. They dislike static shows, strength like lifting, and prefer wrestling. Endurance challenges like mountain climbing or drinking contests. Um, dueling with rules, by the way. Again, stereotypes. And of course, hunting. Orcs prefer to wear trophies of their greatest victories. That said, this being a from a source which only saw orcs as savages, this enlists elf ears and shrunken heads as potentials. But it also does include wearing a lock of their mate's hair. I'll continue to use the word mate because we have very little proof of orcish monog monogamy. 
Um, examples given of communal trophies, going back to the bloody, include totems made of bones of slain legions, or less bloody, thrones of conquered kingdoms. One last note when it comes to war, or war beasts. Various animals orcs have what call tamed to fight for them. These include standards like dogs and crows, to more orcish standards like rhinoceros and mammoths, to legends like owlbears. Who needs horses, really? Now, it is time for a major surprise. Despite their being otherwise, orcs do practice crafts. Okay, so crafting is considered unmanly, and Belkson has the whole why buy when you can take mentality. But orcs do make things, chief among their weapons, but orcs do create a wide variety of things under two basic rules. It does not have to be fancy, but it needs to be intimidating. One of the examples given are drinking containers. Now you know what Anthony Pell is by the clothes. <laughs> Morality act location is not something they consider in their wheelhouse. Dying is 100%. Each tribe tends to have their own colors and orcs work hard to make their clothing clearly show which groups they are part of. This also extends to hair dye, with female orcs known to dye their hair various shades of green or red which drives men wild. Finally, in talks about fashion, orcs like to wear masks, with the reason given being because they can be scarier than what their own features, or they can cover features they are not exactly proud of. They are, these are especially common among two groups we are about to talk about, shamans and witch doctors, to the point which doctors consider it taboo to appear unmasked. But before we move on to our final round, let's go with side tangent number three, the happy fellow. This is one of the oldest cultural touchstones we have of the orcs, going back to one of the first adventure paths, even before the Orcs of Galarian book, actually. In it, we get a brief description of a ghost story made to scare young orcs. I have it separate because, well, it is not about an orc, it's about an elf. The story tells of a boogeyman known as the Happy Fellow, an elf who comes to eat children who smile too much. <laughs> Nothing beyond that, really, but it does give another fascinating look into the society that has grown in the whole of Elkson, and establish how it is different from ours, but even from the earliest of Pizer's publishings, not that foreign. Anyway, when it comes to, well, let's call this section the magic section, because we are technically looking at both kinds of magic. You see, orcs, only orcs and orcs, no real information about the others, only really believe in divine magic. Orc shamans, what they call divine casters of any divine caster in their tribes, are trained from a young age to master the power of the gods. This is an especially hard internship, because of how competitive it is in the horde and the fact that each tribe only allows one shaman, the strongest. Witch doctors, on the other hand, are independently trained arcane users, who work to get to the point where they can declare themselves chosen by the gods, because that is the way orcs will actually respect arcane. However, these rich doctors tend to be popular to the annoyance of shamans, and they can easily steal the hearts and the coveted spot of headcasters from their divine counterparts. Which brings us to our last side tangent. Actually, a relook at a side tangent from a couple weeks ago. Orc deities. Now that we have taken an actual look at orcs, let's look a little deeper. First, however, I should mention how far we have come. The Orcs of Galarian books listed each of the orcish deities not by name, 
but by tail, and hinted that they might not even exist. Just the mad worshippings of barbarian tribes. History fans that don't know how that talk goes. <laughs> then in the whole of Belkson books, we did get a full look and profile of these deities. Well, most of these deities. The section in Orcsigalorian, where they are listed, also lists a few less common Orcish deities. They are the Stormlord, a deity who appears to coastal orcs. The Burning One, more often worshipped by desert orcs. And the Ice God, or who is worshipped in the Arctic. Looking more into these, and more importantly seeing if they are the same chaotic evil, would be something interesting to see in the future. But that said, the Orcish deities, part two. Let's look at how these deities might look outside of the prejudices that people have for orcs. First, let's get a few ones out of the way. Zograth the Destroyer, the oldest known orc deity, there is no re redeeming him. He is 100% chaotic evil. And any attempts to say otherwise is just going to be incorrect. Then we have Lanishta the Slave Lord and Varex the Despoiler. These are gods of orcs' needs to subjugate the weak and take from others. Which, as we already mentioned, only apply to Belkson orcs. Orcs in other places, by sharing similar beliefs, protect the weak and give what they need from those they protect. So both of these deities do not apply to the wider orc community. So, on to those that we can examine closer. One I will not be examining is Rull. Because we have already established that there is nothing wrong with Roll. The man is a good guy, alignment be damned. Next, let's look at Lord Gref. Lord Gref is 100% not a good dude. But he is a de the deity of Orcish fury that all orcs, no matter their background, ha have. So while he is still evil, he is also one I can see all ethnicities of orcs potentially worshipping, if only the evil members. Then we have Selzelvian, the Fire God, and Vogue the Iron Warrior. Magic and technology, respectively. Which, when you look at their descriptions, you see nothing bad about them. We have a few things about their worshippers competing to be Delia, but there is nothing saying that they themselves are into blood sports. It makes one wonder how orcish cultures outside of Belkson might interpret them. Finally, Dretha, the Dark Mother, is patron of orcs who defend their mates and children, and who believes in strength in numbers. Frankly, she is right behind Rull in being a deity who is really not that bad. So, in conclusion, if Paizo does not introduce these orc deities in 2e soon, I encourage people to consider looking into potentially taking the orcish gods for a spin homebrew wise. They are all a bit rough around the edges, and some of them are completely without redemption, but some good aligned orc worshippers might be able to pull the gods of their ancestors into an interesting direction. And that is my dissertation on the orcs. They like battle, are easy to anger, but if you respect them, then you have a powerful friend on your side. Now that we have gotten the heart of the orc month out of the way, we have one more video for this month. It is not technically about orcs, but instead one of the most legendary warriors to live in the whole Merxen. Are you ready to meet the legendary ruler of Skarwal? See you next week.